Okay, so we're going to do ozonolysis. And ozonolysis is the splitting of a molecule using ozone, as the name would suggest, lysis, ozone, ozonolysis. Um, but specifically, it allows us to split double bonds. So we're going to do this example, but it works uh, really quite generally for double bonds. So this is our alkene. Sorry, it works quite generally for alkenes, not all double bonds, but it works quite generally for alkenes. And this is ozone. So O3, the same stuff that makes up the ozone layer. And ozone is a very good example of a 1,3 dipole. It's got a negative charge on one end, and it's got an oxygen that's double bonded to another oxygen in the center that's got a formal positive charge on it. Now the only way to get rid of this formal positive charge is to attack this oxygen here, so that pair of electrons, one of those two pairs of electrons, can be given to the central oxygen. So it's a 1,3 dipole, positive on this end, negative on this end. The negative end can attack the double bond, while the other end is attacked by that double bond, and you can relieve the charge on the central oxygen. And when you do, you make a five-membered ring. So, I took that pair of electrons, moved it there, that pair of electrons back onto that oxygen, and that pair of electrons, and made that bond there. So all of the atoms are neutral you get this species here. So a 1,2,3 trioxalane, or an ozonide, and they are not very stable, and in fact the reverse happens. So you get the reverse of the 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition, and we can do that by just pushing the pairs of electrons around, and again, if we follow our usual rules, then Try it exactly as it was, except for what has been moved by an arrow. And we can see what we're going to make is something rather unusual looking. So we took that pair of electrons there, and we've made an aldehyde on one side, that's normal looking, but we've made a peroxyaldehyde, or the oxide of an aldehyde here, because it's got an extra oxygen on it. Well, they don't hang around for a uh, long amount of time because this is a, another excellent example of a 1,3 dipole and it will react again with, in this case, the benzaldehyde but the aldehyde, except that it's going to react in the opposite uh, orientation. So let me draw those out in the opposite orientation down here, a little bit equals to sign because I'm drawing out exactly the same thing, except just in a different orientation. I left out a positive charge up there. And now these are under, going to undergo 1,3 uh, dipolar cycloaddition. So dipole attacks one end and the double bond breaks and attacks the other end, relieving the positive charge in the centre. And now, instead of having a 1,2,3 trioxalane, we've got a 1,2,4 trioxalane. And 1,2,4 trioxalanes are actually in some cases, probably not in this case, but in some cases if you've got very sterically hindered examples, are uh, you can isolate them. They're stable enough to be isolated. But this isn't what we want as our final product. We want to be able to turn this into a pair of aldehydes, or we want to lyse the bond, as the name of the reaction suggested. So at this point we have to put in, in order to get the aldehydes back, we have to put in a mild reducing agent, usually triphenylphosphine or dimethyl sulfide. With those two you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Dimethyl sulfide is going to smell terribly. Triphenylphosphine makes triphenylphosphine oxide, which is very difficult to remove from your reaction. In any event, the mechanism is identical. So if we put in our dimethyl sulfide, sulfur group 6, two lone pairs on it, one of those lone pairs can attack an oxygen. And that's an unusual thing. Uh, you don't normally attack oxygens, but this oxygen has a bond to another oxygen. So we can attack this oxygen and move this pair of electrons into the carbon-oxygen double bond, make another carbon-oxygen double bond here, and then give that pair of electrons back to the oxygen. And let's see what we're left with here. Well, when you're faced with a set of arrows like this, which is relatively complex or hard to follow, then that's the best time to draw everything out exactly as it was, except for what's gone missing. So 
That bond is there, no arrows. That bond is gone. That oxygen is still there, because it has to be. That bond, nothing going from it, is still there. That bond, missing. The two methyl groups are still attached to the sulfur, and one lone pair is there. And that oxygen still has that bond there, because that wasn't moved either. We Let's start at this bond. We took that bond, made a new carbon-oxygen double bond, so that's our allied. We took this pair of electrons and we gave it all to the oxygen, which now has a negative charge. We took this pair of electrons, which was in the sulfur lone pair, and we've now created an oxygen-sulfur bond. So that sulfur is now positively charged. And you'll recognize that as being dimethyl sulfoxide. And we took this pair of electrons here and we remade our second aldehyde. So we can take an alkene and treat it with ozone and then treat it with a mild reducing agent to make two aldehydes. Well, we can also treat it with a stronger reducing agent if we want. So it doesn't have to be DMS and we don't have to get aldehydes. If you treat it with something like sodium borohydride, then what we will end up getting is benzyl alcohol and ethanol. So we'd end up with the two corresponding alcohols. And if we treat it with something more oxidizing, like potassium permanganate, uh, or something oxidizing, not more oxidizing, if, uh, if we treat it with an oxidizing agent, then we'll end up with the two carboxylic acids. So in this case, we'd end up with benzoic acid and ethanoic acid. So it's a very useful reaction uh, for taking a carbon-carbon double bond and using that to produce an aldehyde. Carbon-carbon double bonds are much more stable than aldehydes, so in a long synthesis, it can be a reasonable way of storing an aldehyde. It's also a very important reaction for other things that you experience uh, in life, or hopefully don't experience. So one of the reasons that photochemical smog occurs is because ozone is produced at city level, so nitrogen oxides that come out of diesel cars produce ozone, and then ozone reacts pretty indiscriminately with uh, alkenes or carbon-carbon double bonds that it finds around the place and there are uh, then produced aldehydes and reactive aldehyde-like species um, or aldehyde oxides um, and if they get inside your lungs they can cause all sorts of irritations because aldehydes are really reactive, um, react with nucleophiles, will form imines, all sorts of different things. So ozone is a toxic gas. Um, ozone at up in the stratosphere or up high up in the atmosphere in the ozone layer absorbs UV light and is very important for life on Earth. But um, down at our part of the atmosphere, it's very toxic because it causes reactions like this and causes reactive intermediates and lung irritation, eye irritation, generally uh, things that you don't want to happen. Anyway. That's a tangent. That's all for now. If you have any questions, uh, post them below or ask me in class or send me an email. Thanks. Bye.